This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening. There has been a tragic mix-up in the Humboldt bus crash. Yeah, after believing their son was alive, a family originally from this province learns their teenage boy has in fact died. For three days, 18-year-old Parker Tobin was listed among the survivors of Friday's crash in Saskatchewan. He'd been traded to the team mid-season. His mother's originally from Hearts Content, his father from Bay Roberts. On Saturday, Rhonda Tobin tweeted her son was in stable condition and was being airlifted to Saskatoon. But this morning, an unbelievable turn. There had been a mistake. Parker Tobin had died in the crash. His teammate, Xavier LaBelle, initially listed among the 15 deceased, had survived. The identities of the two boys had been confused. Uh, a lot of these boys looked alike. They had the blonde hair that was supportive of their team uh, for their playoff run. They're very similar builds. Uh, they're all very similar ages and they're very athletic, of course, as they are junior A hockey players. I don't think anything you could ever say would be enough. Um, I'm the father of three boys. Uh, you know, two have spent significant time on buses traveling this province. Um, you know, and I can't even imagine putting myself in those family shoes to first get the notice that their loved ones have been in a collision of this nature and then you know to find out that who they had thought was their loved one wasn't potentially actually their their loved one um, I, I can't even fathom and I don't think enough could ever be said. Now the accident happened Friday evening when a bus carrying the Humboldt Broncos collided with a semi-trailer north of Tisdale, Saskatchewan. 15 people were killed, including 10 players, two coaches, and the bus driver. 14 others were injured. The junior hockey team was on their way to a playoff game. As the nation grieves, here at home, hundreds of high school hockey players are heading to paradise for a major tournament. The opening game is just about to begin, and players, coaches, and parents all have Humboldt on their minds and in their hearts. Here now, Zach Gowdy is there and he's joining us live. So Zach, what's happening? Well, this is a big moment for these young men. There are hundreds of high school hockey players here representing 16 high schools from across the province. And this week they will be here in Paradise competing for the Beaumont Hamill Centennial Cup. Tonight's opening match is Gonzaga versus O'Donnell. And as so many sporting matches have done this weekend, before they play, they will pay their respects to the victims of the Humboldt bus tragedy. They are just gathering up the pucks in the opening warm-up now. You're seeing the players lining up by their benches, but in just a moment they will be mixing at center ice uh, in a moment of silence, a tribute to all of those affected by the Humboldt bus disaster. You know, I got to speak to some of these young men on their way in here tonight, and I kept hearing the same words repeated over and over. It could have been us, it could have been us. Every one of those players knows what it's like to ride in a van along with their friends down a lonesome highway in order to do what they love, in order to play hockey. For some of these uh, young players you're seeing there, this is their last major tournament with the friends that they have spent their whole high school careers with. For others, it's the first, but each of them looked into the faces of those young people who were killed this weekend doing what they themselves spent so much time doing thought to themselves, that could have been me. As the music fades, we'll have a moment of silence. For the recent tragedy in Saskatchewan, along the junior A Humboldt Pro Broncos, please rise and move your head for a moment of silence on behalf of the lives lost. A moving moment there, uh, folks, here as we stand at the Paradise Double Ice Complex. A moment of silence. The way that so many games and sporting matches at all levels of athletics have happened this weekend with a moment of silence and respect for the Humboldt victims before this game gets underway. Now, a little later in the show, you'll get to hear from some of these players about their thoughts on this disaster. But right now, we'll send it back to the studio.
Thanks so much, Zach. And that is our Zach Gowdy, as you can see, live tonight in paradise. And we will see you shortly, Zach. Thank you. In other news now, strikers have been on the picket lines at the entrances to the IOC mine since late last month, and there is no sign of a resolution. Tonight, unionized workers and supporters march through the town to the main gates in hopes of getting their message across to management. The rally is still underway, and that's where here and now's Jacob Barker is. So, Jacob, who is speaking there tonight? Well, actually, the speakers uh, just finished, but if the union was looking for the community, community members to come out and support tonight, and just a few minutes ago, a massive crowd walked up the street and joined what was already a pretty large crowd up here tonight. So if the goal was to show that there is solidarity here amongst the community, they definitely uh, showed that with this rally. Well... You, you, see, you see here, if you stand here long enough, you see just about everybody tooting their horns at us, showing us uh, support. People have been bringing in food, and coffee, and we're getting a lot of support. This, this town is not all about IOC workers, as everybody in this town is affected. What's the point of this rally? What are you trying to drive home with this? Well, it's like I said, this uh, don't only affect uh, IOC workers, this is the whole town. Yeah. This is our town, it's our, our iron ore, and you know, what, what this company tries to do to us time and time again is, is not right. Well, the support is the town is behind us 100%. I mean, you know, all you got to do is visit the picket lines and see the number of donations every day with food and drinks and endless amount of support right from the community itself. So hopefully today we can give them a little bit back just by having a barbecue and stuff and getting everybody to meet together as one and show, you know, show everybody that we're, we're united here. So who knows if this crowd had anything to do with it, but Ron Thomas, the union president here, just told everybody that they are talking to the company again, and they're working out details to get back to the table. Definitely welcome news and a big cheer from people here as he told them that. Reporting live for Here and Now in Labrador City, I'm Jacob Barker. A man who caused the death of two men and injured another was fined $180 in provincial court in St. John's today. The truck Kyle Follett was driving slammed into the back of an SUV two years ago on the Trans-Canada near Butterpot Park. Here now's Glenn Payette reports. Today, Kyle Follett was found guilty of causing an accident that took the lives of Randy Ralph on the left and Shannon Pittman and leaving Dwayne Dalton in the blue shirt with serious head injuries. Follett was driving this truck when it slammed into the back of this RAV4. Ralph and Pittman were passengers in it. Dalton was the driver. In a victim impact statement, Pittman's widow Sarah said, the suffering is hell. No 38-year-old wife should have to pick out an urn for their husband. His daughter wrote, little girls never stop needing their daddy. I'm no exception. The wife of Randy Ralph, Francis, told the court, life is unfair. How will I get through the day when our daughter walks down the aisle without her dad? Dalton, who was brain injured in the crash, said he felt useless to his young family. His wife, Lori, told the court she wondered if he would ever be the man she married, and that one day he said he'd understand if she left him. She told him she wasn't going anywhere. The three wives all talked about the pain this has caused them and their families and how it changed their lives forever. Judge Colin Flynn told the families that suffering and pain are what the courts hear, but that what he heard today was beyond what he's heard in his career. The RCMP did not charge Follett with a criminal offense, but rather charged him under the Highway Traffic Act with driving without due care or attention. Because of that, he was fined $180, the most he could get and no other sentence. Sarah Pittman says she has been working with government to change the act and stiffen the penalties. Soon, the fine could be up to $20,000 and two years in prison. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's.
Well, a full on spring blizzard walloped western Newfoundland today. Roads from the northern peninsula all the way to Burgio were closed due to high winds and heavy drifting, with some areas getting close to 50 centimeters of snow. Here now's Colleen Connors has the least desirable job today at CBC because she's out in the midst of all of this and she's joining us live. So, Colleen, what's it like now? Well, Peter, it's a perfect day for January. <laughs> uh, high gusts of wind have been blowing all day, messing around that 30 plus centimeters of snow all over Corner Brook. Really poor driving conditions. I can't uh, tell you that enough. Whiteout conditions, poor visibility all day. It really seemed like Corner Brook completely shut down today on this very windy spring day. Uh, schools were closed, provincial government offices closed. Uh, we had the courthouse and even many restaurants and retail stores shut their doors during this spring storm. Even the buses were hauled off the roads. Uh, it's all because of that high wind and of course the quick accumulation of all that snow that fell on the west coast. Some people tried to venture out and clean their driveways and uh, get going, but it was the city staff, the eight loaders that were really caught up in this and of course noticed that poor visibility as well. So with a lot of wind, you'll get drifts, and if we get 20 or 30 centimeters with no wind, it's not a real big problem. It's a lot of snow, but it's not such a problem. Uh, I know one place in, in uh, Curly near on uh, uh, Woodcrest, the, the loader operator told me this is loader brought up solid. Such a big drift coming in from, from the bay, so we've got to take our time, push it back, punch through it. But basically what we're doing now is open the roads up today, get them passable for tomorrow, and then we'll start our push back clean up. Now, Kennedy just hopes that by tomorrow this wind will die down and his crews can start to widen the roads and clean up the big mess that's happening in Cornerbrook right now. Ryan, I have to ask you, when is this wind ever going to let up and are we ever going to see grass in Cornerbrook? <laughs> you love the snow in Cornerbrook on the West Coast. That's all I hear all winter and you finally get some and now you guys are complaining. No, I joke, of course. Uh, April, uh, yeah, a little late for even this. Uh, thank you very much, Colleen. To your question, uh, when will the winds die down a little bit? Well, certainly they're going to start to ease off uh, as early as this evening. Not really until the overnight will we start to really hear those winds start to ease off on the windows. Uh, have a look, first of all, at the top gusts today. 131, that's a private station in Trinity Bay, Green Island, 131 there. Bonavista, 125. St. Anthony at 120. St. John's Airport at 115. So this even for Newfoundland standards, this is a windy, windy uh, event and a windy storm here that's uh, winding its way away from the northern peninsula as we speak. These are your current gusts, still gusting to 100 in St. John's in Cape Race, 111 in Bonavista, 107 in Twinlingate. In terms of your timeline, this is the forecast model output. You can see as the low drifts away tonight, these winds through this evening starting to ease off. The gusts dropping below 100 kilometers per hour around midnight. By the time we get to early tomorrow, we're just looking at some gusts in the 50, 60, 70 kilometer per hour range, and those winds will continue to ease as the low moves out into the Labrador Sea through the day tomorrow. So certainly a lighter wind day, especially into the afternoon, even some sun in the mix, and I'll break down your full forecast details coming up in just a few minutes. Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. And while the wind may calm down later, its power was certainly on full display earlier. While St. John's International Airport was open, there wasn't much moving. Nope, some flights were able to land, but virtually nothing was able to take off. That included a flight to Orlando that Paul Jones and five others in his party were trying to get out on. No go. Too much wind. And what's the latest that you've heard on when you'll be rebooked? I have no idea. We're trying to get show here now we're on the phone but we don't know pretty disappointing now in downtown st john's across from the delta this brick facade gave way damaging at least one vehicle mm. in the parking lot not a good monday for him meanwhile at memorial university campus security has westerland road shut down at the pedway between the physical education building and the aqua arena and around lunchtime, this U-Haul trailer made its way down Kenmount Road, only coming to a stop after hitting this SUV. Runaway trailer. Al Chislett, the co-discoverer of the massive Voises Bay nickel deposit in northern Labrador, has died. Chislett, along with his fellow prospector Christopher Verbisky, discovered Voises Bay in 1993. 
The nickel deposit proved to be one of Canada's most substantial mineral discoveries. The two men co-owned a prospecting company and found the deposit while working in Labrador. The discovery triggered a bidding war, with Chislett and Verbisky eventually selling their royalty interest in the mine for $180 million. Chislett attempted to enter politics and co-founded the Newfoundland and Labrador Party, but it petered out after a few years. Al Chislett was 69 years old and he had been battling cancer. Well, there's a new leader for the provincial NDP. Jerry Rogers won over the weekend with more than 60% of the vote. About 1,400 party members voted in the leadership race. Rogers has been an MHA for seven years and says she's going to have to work to grow the party beyond the two seats it currently holds. I know there's a daunting task uh, ahead of us, but I also feel incredibly hopeful. This weekend has been an incredible convention. Uh, the room has been filled with activists. We've done great work together. And uh, I feel also very humbled. And I feel honored. Navigating the north coast of Labrador is challenging at best. The weather, it can change in an hour or it can hold stormy for days. The Labrador Coast, you always gotta expect the non-expected. Join CBCNL as we hitch a ride with Air Borealis, the last link in the supply chain to Labrador's most remote communities. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Well, as I know all too well, forecasting the weather in Labrador 
is a challenge. But there's another group that's watching it even more closely than I am. Air Borealis flies to remote northern communities along the coast. Its flights, of course, depend on the local weather conditions. I was lucky enough to fly to Labrador with the CBC crew to see how they do it. Here's part one of our three-part series, Navigating the North Coast. Just before sunrise in mid-February. It's minus 23 with a wind chill of minus 37. Most people are still in bed. But here, it's a hot bed of activity. Prepping the planes for a busy day of flying. Carrying people, patients and cargo to remote locations along Labrador's north coast. But with the unpredictable weather, those plans can change in an instant. We're seeing a lot more inclement weather, inclement weather that certainly uh, brings flight interruptions. It's uh, more exciting, I think, than, uh, than flying the bigger aircraft. It's more challenge. I got thousands of stories. The Labrador Coast, you always got to expect the non-expected. Air Borealis has nine twin otters, the aircraft of Canada's north. Owned by two indigenous groups, the Innu and the Inuit, operated by PAL Airlines. The partnership is less than a year old. Its logo, an Inukshuk, green for the northern lights. Stones representing the communities it serves. Rigolette, Makovic, Postville, Hopedale, Notwishish, and Nain. Accessible only by plane for most of the year, with no road or even water access in the winter months, these communities are at the mercy of Mother Nature each location with a different topography and weather. Every day, travel, food, medical supplies and appointments, they all depend on these planes. If you have rain, drizzle and fog in, in St. John's or Corner Brook, you turn on your windshield wipers. Well, for somebody living in Nain or in Natoshish, uh, that means that the flight is not coming today. Navigating the north coast of Labrador is challenging at best. The weather, it can change in an hour or it can hold stormy for days. The captains here at Air Borealis use forecasts issued by Nav Canada, Environment Canada, weather observations taken along the coast of Labrador, but most importantly, they use the decades of experience they have from flying up this very coastline. Neil Purchase has flown Twin Otters out of Happy Valley Goose Bay for the past 15 years. We base a lot of stuff out of Halifax with our uh, METAR and TAV and the GFA. We're also looking for the local knowledge of the strip operators, the, uh, the agents that are on the coast. And after a number of years, most of these people got a pretty good grasp on the weather. First thing we check here in the morning is our weather and our operational flight plan. So we'll have a route picked out by our dispatcher and then, of course, we got to get the weather that corresponds with that route. In 31 years, Kevin Han has flown through it all. There have been some good flights. There have been some uh, not so good flights. Pretty well seen uh, every weather condition that's up there. Uh, the winds are always blowing fairly hard. 30 knots is a calm day. This morning in Maine, it's uh, 30 knots of wind and 32 below. So uh, you get that kind of situation and uh, visibilities are down. And uh, yeah, you gotta kind of watch what you're doing with the weather systems. And uh, if the weather is uh, marginal or no good, uh, we just call the shot and we don't go. In some cases, it's a race against time, like a recent medevac out of Rigolet. We knew we had an hour to get there. A uh, young baby got born, and it's not like your typical hospital setting. The lady came out, she was in the back of a comatic, the nurse was straddled across the comatic, and the baby was wrapped. So yeah, it's definitely an interesting place to work. Everybody got back Everybody here, got yeah. out, safe and sound. As the sun sets in beautiful, calm, happy Valley Goose Bay, it's the winds in Nain, now gusting to 100 kilometers per hour, that have our attention and our pending plans for the morning. We have a flight that was supposed to be going to Nain. Uh, the wind has really picked up 
And so they've decided to sue Wendy, so they're so going to go to Oakdale me. instead. That's correct. How often does this happen where they have to redirect? Not a lot, but there is a, there is a percentage that comes into play where some days you're planning uh, on a forecast that's built at 6 in the morning. Come 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the forecast didn't play out the way it was meant to. Okay, so it's tomorrow morning. We're supposed to be going to Nain. Uh, what do you think our chances are for getting up there tomorrow, say mid to late morning? Uh, right now, they're calling for a gust of 30 knots up on the northern part of the coast. Uh, you're sitting right between two low pressure systems, uh, one moving in, one moving out, one dying. So right now, the weather early in the mor tomorrow morning, the weather will cooperate. The winds, I'm not sure. And I don't know if it's going to be a large window. By lunchtime, we could have some snow moved into uh, Nain and Hopedale. Yeah, with that next low coming in. That's right. Yeah. So our window is short tomorrow for Nain. And that it is. Yeah. Okay, so fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers right. crossed. Good luck. Thank you. All right, on. see you guys. Tomorrow, part two of navigating the North Coast and what it takes to ship food to Nain. The Edge make the most of their home court advantage against the Windsor Express.
Welcome back, everyone. I have to say, Ryan, I like part one of your you. uh, series from up north. We'll get part two tomorrow. I guess the good news is we know you did actually make it out. <laughs> or maybe yeah. you didn't even get to Nain. You, I guess we'll have to tune in tomorrow to find don't out. Don't give away too much, uh, Peter. Don't want any spoiler alerts here. Now, we've got to move along because there's a lot of weather, a yeah. lot coming in the program. Uh, so... Yeah, so in terms of the warnings and watches, let's get right to it. Uh, not as far north as Nain, but to Makovic and also Rigolet and Postville under those uh, blowing snow advisories. So stormy along the coast of Labrador as this system uh, tracks out into the Labrador Sea over the next 24 hours. We still have a blizzard warning in effect for Cartwright down into the Straits. Eagle River also under a blizzard warning as well as the Northern Peninsula. There's a snow squall warning still in effect for Corner Brook and Bay St. George. Wind warnings in effect across the island for the north, the south coast and the Avalon. There is the low. You can see the center of it just starting to spin away from the Northern Peninsula and a very impressive low in case you missed it earlier. Top gusts that I could find at a private weather station, 131 kilometer per hour gust at a green Island in Trinity Bay. That low departs and a bit of a break for Tuesday. And then we're watching a couple of systems, uh, one developing here uh, over the southeast parts of the U.S. That's going to be the really interesting one to watch. And then this one off to the west will bring a little bit of uh, mixed precipitation into the mix. It appears for the later parts of the week into the weekend. Here's how things will play out. Watch your timeline here. Very windy over the next few hours. But as we roll into the 9 p.m. to midnight time frame. That's when those winds will really start to back off. Tomorrow morning, we're starting the day with some uh, Newfoundland type winds. Certainly windy by mainland standards, but talking about some gusts in the 40, 50, 60 kilometer per hour range, nothing uh, that we haven't seen before. But factor in the temperatures, it's going to be a chilly start out there. No question about that. You're going to want to bundle those kids up. As uh, we take a look into the afternoon, winds will continue to ease off. Talking about some gusts in the 30, 40, maybe 50 kilometer per hour range along areas of the coastline. Highs tomorrow are going to be near the freezing mark. Could get as warm as 2 degrees along the southern parts of the Buren Peninsula. Onshore flurries along the west coast and along the south coast will ease into the afternoon. For the coast of Labrador, nice day in Nain. Uh, looks like some uh, good landing and flying conditions there down towards Cartwright. Chance of seeing some flurries there back towards Happy Valley Goose Bay and Labrador City. But overall, it's pretty quiet. Wednesday, the interesting one here, and we'll talk more about this in your long range, is this system that's going to be tracking just to the south. Forecast models differing on exactly how uh, close it will get to the Avalon. Certainly the potential for some accumulating snow here, but right now, even the strongest, uh, I think, uh, or the highest amounts uh, could be around 5 to 10 centimeters. So it'll be at least less than that based on the latest projections, maybe even less than 5 centimeters. It will all depend on how close that system tracks. And I'll, of course, keep you posted on that over the next uh, couple of days. I do have some light snow in the forecast right now. So, again... Keep that in mind if you do have travel plans on Wednesday. Areas to central and west just getting brushed by this one. And Wednesday looks like a terrific day across Labrador, although a little on the chilly side. Now into the uh, Thursday and Friday time period, weak disturbance tracking in from the south. Uh, but that's not going to really be an, an issue for Newfoundland. Just an increase in clouds and a bit of light flurry action in the Labrador. Long range details in your weekend. Coming up, Debbie. Thank you, Ryan. The provincial government is looking for proposals to reactivate a park that was closed more than 20 years ago. It has issued a call for proposals from people interested in operating the former Glenwood Park in central Newfoundland. The province says any new operator would have to upgrade facilities, so opening the park this summer is unlikely. Well, it may have been the most colorful place in the province this weekend. Sci-Fi on the Rock convention in St. John's. The fun wrapped up yesterday with an out-of-this-world fashion show. 60 of the convention's bravest and boldest took part in the grand finale costume contest yesterday. Many worked on their costumes for months with some eye-popping results. The convention is the province's biggest celebration of science fiction, fantasy and pop culture. Congratulations to the costume winners, Nicole Maddox, Heather Lane, and Bailey Reed. May you live long and prosper. And thanks to everyone who stopped by the CBCNL Sci-Fi Selfie Booth. CBC is a partner in the convention, and the booth was a great opportunity to get involved. Well over 100 people came by and took turns posing in front of our enchanted green screen. They got to pick a sci-fi background for an out-of-the-world souvenir.
Well, the St. John's Edge pulled out two big wins on the weekend at Mile One Center. Friday night, the game went into double overtime. Here's how it ended. With just seven seconds left on the clock, the Windsor Express got the ball for a chance to tie the game, but it was not to be. Then on Sunday afternoon, the team won in regulation time 119 to 107. Game three in the best of five series is on Wednesday in Windsor. Meanwhile, in Vegas yesterday, Team Guju ran out of luck. This was Brad Guju's last shot at the World Championships. He fell to Sweden by a score of 7 to 3. The team he defeated last year in Edmonton to win the World Championship. There's no rest for the weary, though. The team started a Grand Slam event in Toronto, and they'll start that tomorrow. They're playing in paradise, but their thoughts are in Humboldt, Saskatchewan. After the break, we'll hear from some of these young hockey players about their thoughts on the crash that claimed so many young lives. In the wake of that deadly bus crash in Saskatoon, a stirring gesture. And it's one that's traveled across Canada and even into the United States. People have been placing hockey sticks outside their homes in honor of the young Humboldt players killed in Friday's crash. It began in their hometown when a resident shared this message, leave it on the porch tonight, the boys might need it wherever they are. Soon dozens followed. Here at home, flags at the Confederation Building in St. John's were lowered to half-mast today. Tonight, City Hall will be lit with the team colors, yellow and green. The same will happen at Confederation Building tomorrow. Back to our Zach Gowdy now, who's standing by in paradise at the Double Ice Complex, where there's a major hockey school, uh, tour, uh, high school hockey tournament underway. Zach, what are people there saying about the tragedy? 
Well, guys, this is a very personal story, I think, for a lot of these young players. I spoke with several before the game began. They each said things like, this could have been me, it could have been us. You know, they are high school players after all, and the youngest victim of this tragedy, only 16 years old. So for a lot of these young players, when they saw the photos of the victims of this crash, it could have been like they were looking in a mirror. Uh, you, it's too small to see on camera, but the organizers of this tournament printed out these stickers. It's of the Humboldt Broncos logo, and the players down there are wearing those stickers on their helmets. But on the way into the game, I met a young man who had crafted his own personal tribute to the Humboldt Broncos. Everybody in the country really thinking about that and thinking about people like you who spend a lot of time on the bus, right? Yeah, that's what I got done in my pads here now, actually, for um, the Humboldt uh, Broncos. They're, that's their color is green and uh, gold, wow. green and yellow. That's a, yeah. nice, that's a nice thing to do. I mean, what, what, what was going through your mind when you were putting those colors on your pads? Well, I was thinking about the goalie that died and their parents from Bay Roberts. And I was just thinking, like, my mom always said they have parents too. And it just made me think how bad they must feel and stuff like that, right? Well done, Liam. Now this is the Royal Newfoundland and Labrador Regiment Memorial High School Hockey Tournament. It is ongoing all week here at the Double Ice Complex in Paradise. There are hundreds of players representing 16 high schools from across the province. And on Thursday, there are four teams traveling to this tournament. The teams uh, representing Corner Brook, Marystown, Grand Falls, Windsor, and Gander. Uh, so we're certainly wishing everybody involved in this tournament a fun and safe week of hockey. Peter and Debbie. Thank you very much. That's Zach Gowdy live tonight in Paradise. Certainly not hard to put yourself in the shoes of many of the parents or players I know. in a province where you have to travel everywhere for sports or drama or any sort of event. Any sort of event and uh, anyway it's such a difficult time. Do you have any fear? As Rick Mercer winds up his show, we take a look back at how he got his first big break. It is time now to meet and celebrate one of our local young athletes. This is five-year-old Ryder Elliott from...
Crowhead Twilling Gate. Ryder's a big fan of hockey and enjoys his time playing with the Twilling Gate Combine. Great work, Ryder. We salute you as today's Young Athlete of the Day. It certainly feels like winter sports are still... Uh, <laughs> Could be viable now. Yeah, yeah <laughs> definitely. All you needed was uh, was a, a big sail behind you and uh, off across any of the icy sidewalks you'd go today. Have a look once more, uh, just in case you missed it off the top of the show, because it didn't show these early, those top wind gusts today. Very impressive. 131 at uh, Green Island Trinity Bay, St. John's YYT, top gust 115. And uh, have a look at the temperatures across North America right now. System moving on to the west coast of uh, North America will be one we have to watch in the future. 32 in Miami today, 12 in Myrtle Beach. And yeah, there's a system developing right there. And that is going to be moving in. Tracking into the over the Grand Banks, how close will be an interesting one to watch is certainly uh, over the next couple of days. There goes our low from or over the last 12 hours or so. We are going to be seeing uh, the last 24 hours or so, I should say. And uh, we are going to be seeing those onshore flurries ease through the day on Tuesday, though still in the mix, uh, even into the early afternoon for the west coast and along the south coast of the island. Into the thir uh, Wednesday time period, rather, this is where our system will start to track in. Now you can see, likely south of Nova Scotia, uh, whether it tracks over the Buren and the Avalon peninsulas with some light snow still remains to be seen. Right now, I'm leaning towards the fact that we will at least see some flakes coming down, though a little early to say just how much. But uh, any of the significant snowfall, I will say, does appear to be set for the offshore. Either way, Going to be keeping a close eye on that one over the next 24 hours or so. Uh, another disturbance tracking into the Maritimes for Thursday won't quite make it here. Uh, we're going to have to wait until it uh, moves in as we roll into the Friday time period uh, with, uh, or I should say Thursday night time period with a few wet flakes. This is going to be our next system to watch for the weekend. Watch your timeline Thursday evening. It'll be tracking in but for Friday into the Maritimes and then into our neck of the woods for Friday afternoon with some snow for Labrador and western parts of Newfoundland, then eventually central and eastern Newfoundland for Friday night based on the latest timing. And then another mix over to some showers by the looks of things by Saturday morning as that low departs. And then some windy conditions once again in behind from the north this time into the Sunday time period. That's kind of how the week looks to be playing out right now. Of course, we will keep you posted as things progress over the next few days, but keeping a close eye on the Wednesday system, Thursday, Friday, looking kind of quiet. And then again, Friday night into Saturday. Do mark that on your calendars. If you do have some travel plans, you're going to want to keep updated on the forecast over the next couple days in Labrador. Again, quite quiet over the next few days, maybe some flurries into the mix Thursday, uh, but certainly that Friday into Saturday system, one that could bring some snow to your neck of the woods as well. Debbie and Peter. Thanks very much, Ryan. Well, now to a man who's made a career of skewering people, especially politicians, Rick Mercer. Tomorrow night, the final hour-long episode of the Rick Mercer Report will air on CBC Television. Yeah, and our Chrissy Holmes got to hang out with Rick and some of his crew last week in Toronto. And we'll get to that story in just a minute. But first, we want to show you part of a profile that Lyndon McIntyre did on Mercer back in the late 90s. And it focused on his decision to quit school. <laughs> For one of his teachers, the decision to leave school made a lot of sense. Lois Brown taught drama. He had a quality that defines Newfoundland humor and which was getting a lot of national attention for Newfoundland performers. He doesn't seem to have any fear, for one thing. Uh, and he's, uh, he doesn't seem to have any sense of, you know, a lot of us are inhibited by what we, we fear other people may disapprove of something we're doing. Mm -hmm. He doesn't seem to have that sense at all. With her help, they'd started a satirical troupe in school, wrote and performed a spoof called the 20-minute psychiatric workout. Then, out of school and living on his own downtown, he went big time. Of course, there used to be riots out of here. To the yeah. venerable Longshoreman's Protective Union Hall, nerve center for the city's phenomenal theater life. And then the theater is up here, of course. At 17, he helped create a theater troupe. Their original material and youthful bombast soon caught the attention of St. John's. He was only 20 when fate delivered the gift that would launch his career, the Meech Lake Accord and Newfoundland's famous descent. 
And then, of course, the lovely eulogy for the province appeared in the Saturday paper, Farewell to Newfoundland, penned by Charles Lynch, former chief of the Southern News Bureau. Oh, my God, what a pig. Well, I've been at this 53 years, and I've Charlie seen Lynch had written that because Newfoundland's then-premier Clyde Wells had helped scuttle the Meech Lake Accord, Canada should scuttle Newfoundland. And Newfoundland skunks it. Well, the hell with you. I say, that's, that's, you're, you're getting pompous, you're getting too big for your britches. My only solace upon reading the article was the knowledge that somewhere in he the He shot back with a one-man show called, Show Me the Button, I'll Push It, or Charles Lynch Must Die, in the National Arts Center in Ottawa. We're on a mission, me and the boys. Basically, Charles Lynch must die. Kick him in the head, poke him in the eye. That little finger's gonna die. And there was Charles Lynch, second row, staring right at him. He didn't miss a beat. He went right at him, place was in stitches, and Rick Mercer became became Rick Mercer on that day. <laughs> Gerald Lunds and Rick Mercer have been creative partners for almost 10 years. He's now one of the producers of This Hour Has 22 Minutes. He discovered Mercer while on a talent hunt in the booming St. John's Theatre community, raising hell from the stage of the old LSPU Hall. And then that's when I saw Rick doing this thing that was slagging the politics, but with a real good pen, a real satiric jab. And I went to him and I said, uh, you're a really cocky kid and you're saucy and you're bright and you're talented. Can you do it in your face? Can you do it in Ottawa if I bring you up? And he said, you know, when do we go? <laughs> when do we go indeed and how far he's The rest come. is history, <laughs> as they say. Yeah. Now, as we mentioned, Chrissy Holmes was in Toronto last week, and that's when she got the chance to chat with one of Rick's associate producers, who's from right here. Yeah, Nick Sexton has been working with the show since it began 15 years ago. So, Nick, you've really been around since the very beginning with the whole Rick Mercer show. I mean, how did it start for you 15 years ago? Uh, it started for me, I was, uh, I just moved to Toronto and I was going to Humber College and of course I kind of flunked out of Humber College, I guess you could say, and um, yeah, I can, I, then I started working here. I became uh, a PA here. These guys, you know, threw me a bone and really helped me out when I needed it and uh, yeah, it was, it was great and now I'm still here 15 years later, so it was uh, probably one of the best things that could have happened to me, really. I thought, you know, I'd, I would come here, I'd work for three years. I'd end up, you know, learning to surf in Hawaii somewhere because <laughs> I used to do skateboard videos and all that. And now it's 15 years later and I got, a, you know, two kids in a house and, uh, and I still haven't surfed. So, yeah, I'm still here. What adventures stand out to you most of all when, when you sort of reminisce? For me, I guess some of the, my highlights would be, you know, I got to do the Pierre Burton thing, which was I got to be the student who ro rolled the joint for Pierre Burton. Hi, I'm Pierre Burton. Looking back on my career, you know, I cannot count the number of times a young man or a young woman has come up to me and said, hey, Mr. Burton, what's the best way to roll a joint? <laughs> well, let me tell you, it's not that way. Well, put that down and we'll start over. I remember someone bought me a beer at a bar and said, hey, you're the guy who rolled the joint for Pierre Burton. So that was really cool. There was also the time Rick slept at Stephen Harper's house. Hey, you kids keep it down there. You're not the boss of me! <laughs> One of the best ones he did was recently he went to Fairyland and he was herded the sheep. So he was a sheep farmer for a day. I, I still don't even really believe we're going to herd sheep here and then push them over this edge and they're just going to walk down and get on a boat. They are here. Okay. Oh, there we go. Here we go. First signs. Look at that. And that shoot nearly like didn't happen. It was like two years in the making. The first time they went, the weather was so bad they couldn't get out, and then they had to go back the next year. So that was probably my favorite one. I think just the image of, of Rick picking up a sheep and putting it in a dory was really fun to me, yeah. All right, all right, sheep lifting, now on CBC Sports. What's Rick Merce like to work with? I've never met him. I hear he's really nice, but, <laughs> but I've never seen him. He's usually on a monitor somewhere talking to me, and I just, just not. No, he's great. <laughs> Rick is probably the example who works the hardest. I mean, he's flying here, he's flying there, and it's then he's doing the sketches, 
then he's doing the rehearsals, then he's doing the live show, I mean, and then he's on a plane the next morning. He, I mean, he works harder than any of us on the show. This will make you calm. We're walking down the street. Jad, I heard you wrote a book. What's the name of your book? Your name. What's the name of your book? It's called Falling Backwards. That's pretty good. I always thought I knew what was funny, and I knew what was great in comedy, but I think after working here, and we're in a writer's room with, with real comedians, stand-ups, and just people that have had, you know, 20 plus years in the business, in Canadian show business, I think it taught me more than anything what a joke really was and how to really sell a joke. You know, when I can't sleep, I count writings. <laughs> Could have been one of those, you know, come back home with his head between his legs kind of stories, which is always the thing you never want to be in New Flint. It's like the saddest thing when someone goes away and comes back, oh, it didn't work out, you know. But no, it worked out. and. Uh, and I'm very grateful. I mean, they took a chance on me after I, you know, dropped out of film school and they took me on and, and I'm still here after all this time. So I, I really, I owe them the world, to be honest with you. Oh, it's lovely to hear from Nick Sexton there. Tomorrow night, Chrissy uh, will have a behind the scenes interview with Rick, recorded on site when he delivered his final rant. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. And as we mentioned, the final Rick Mercer report is going to be on CBC television tomorrow night at 8.30 Island Time, 8 o'clock in most of Labrador. Well, I love this picture uh, because yes, still April. <laughs> and uh, this one was taken on the west coast. It's called the Pillow Valley Warden. And that's the warden overlooking, of course, Pillow Valley. Now, if you can guess where this was taken in western Newfoundland, near Gross Morn, but the specific location will you get huge, huge bonus points. Uh, you gave us lots of clues. But <laughs> nothing. This I got is a nothing. really, really <laughs> tough one. This is the back country, so, oh. uh, but there is a lake there, if you can name it. What do I win, Ryan? Uh, credibility. <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking for some of that. <laughs>Welcome back everyone. Well, you know you're having a bad day when there were no injuries, but there are plenty of questions after a silo demolition in southern Denmark went very wrong. Have a look at this. Ooh. 
Yeah, a crowd was on hand to watch a planned explosion to bring down the 53 meter silo, but six months of preparation didn't produce the expected result. The silo tipped and fell in the wrong direction. Oh dear. <laughs> it damaged a cultural center that includes a library and music school. The library says most of the interior was undamaged but very dusty. Whoops. <laughs> I remember seeing the demolition of the stack. I believe it was out in Stephenville. This was some time ago. Usually they're so precise, they fall exactly where it's planned. Not that one. No. <laughs> the, the guy who designed it probably said, that's what it was supposed to do. <laughs> Didn't I tell you? <laughs> Down oh, well, left. The other left. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Uh, OK, so picture. a viewer, viewer picture, yep. And uh, a beautiful one, again, backcountry. Uh, snowmobiling, and this one was uh, sent uh, to CBC. So here we are. Grossmorn is, of course, on your left. There's uh, Route 430 that goes up into the Rocky Harbor region. So this is east of that, literally in the back country. And this is Angus Lake. Okay. And Blair Snook took this picture. And again, that looks like a snowman <laughs> overlooking uh, uh, the valley. And it uh, looks like, again, a a nice pine tree wrapped in snow there by the looks of it, but That's beautiful shot. Beautiful shot. It looks so pristine, and uh, for those who get to travel in there, what a treat. Yeah. It'd be even nicer if that wasn't April, but, you know, <laughs> maybe I'm just being picky. Now, speaking of treats, we saw part one of your three-part series tonight, your travels up the Labrador coast. Yeah. What's ahead tomorrow? Tomorrow, again, all about foods and goods and how to get them to Nain. And of course, uh, really looking forward to Chrissy's part two as well. Me too. With Rick Mercer, absolutely. Yeah. Time for us to say good night. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Thanks for watching.